Well, uh, thank you very much uh, to Professor Seleguin, to Antonio, to the organizer of uh, PES for inviting us here. And uh, uh, I will address the um, specifically particular pyrolysis, uh, the thermochemical processing, from the industrial point of view. And I will close uh, uh, my presentation focusing more on the policy matter, because at the end of the day, even if we are researchers, I'm learning more and more how the policy is a driving element. So that's a, a short overview. I will go through it, the introduction on the, on the topic. And then I have uh, some few, few comments on the industrial uh, historical development of pyrolysis to report some uh, industrial initiatives in Europe. Then to have a look to the product we're talking about, the first pyrolysis by oil comparing and also reporting some uh, interesting studies done in comparing decentralized and centralized schemes, which is already partly addressed by Professor Seleki. Uh, I, I will recall some of your point in my presentation. Uh, go for cost estimation and then ask ourselves uh, what else can we do with this tarim liquid. Probably we will have some interesting uh, observations. Then I will just show that uh, parolis can be used also with other liquids, uh, with other feedstocks that uh, sometimes uh, offer opportunities for parolysis to be competitive with other solutions that are currently, uh, I wouldn't say established, but are the, the one the people focus more. Again, I will go back for a moment to aviation biofuel because it's so important in that moment that we should understand what we are talking about and which is the complexity of doing this. And then, as I said, I will conclude on, on policy and which are, from the industrial point of view, specifically from that angle, uh, where are the problems in policy development? Why policy, especially in my region of the world, in Europe, is so ineffective to stimulate industry to invest in this field rather than in developing an app for your mobile phone? Well, this I will skip because you will have. We are based in Florence. We are a research institution funded by the university where I teach energy conversion technologies and process and with some labs and pilot plans. And these are the fields we work basically is thermochemical, uh, some also biochemical activity, but basically on the engineering point of view. We design algae plant, but we are not microbiologists. We do the engineering work, but that's an example. So, okay, first parolis and HTL. In that period, we are facing a mass of opportunities of processes. And uh, uh, sometimes I, I see these sketches that are with arrows connecting feedstock and processes. And then at the end of the day, you don't understand even where is the line you should follow. So uh, try to keep it simple. This is from Dr. Maniades. I have developed similar graphs. The point is that my feeling is that we are in a period in which biochemical processing and thermochemical processing, bioproducts and bioenergy, uh, bioliquid and biofuels for transport, all these options are connecting each other. This also makes very complicated to define the configuration of the plant and also the TRL or, or FRL, fuel readiness levels in the case of aviation, that uh, uh, Professor Selegim illustrated to us in the previous presentation, because more complicated, because we have more options. Economic sustainability is depending on all these streams coming out from a biorefinery uh, configuration, which is not yet established. Maybe it's the first of a kind if it's a very good high level stage. Otherwise, we are much, much lower development stage, pilot demo, small demo, commercial demo. And, uh, and this uh, is, is very relevant for the industry. We are looking for industry to invest that. Uh, just to clarify among ourselves, and I will come back to these slides later. For us, in Europe, advanced biofuels is feedstock based only. I mean, a fuel is advanced, a biofuel is named advanced only on the base of the feedstock the process is using which for us as researchers and technicians is really, uh, I don't like this approach to be <laughs> very frank, but that is the situation. So we have to work with this. And we must be very careful because if I set a very ambitious target for advanced biofuels from a very difficult feedstock with a very high greenhouse gas saving, 
at the end uh, of the story, there's no plant, there is no production in place because the technology and the industry is not ready. There is no sufficient uh, interest or motivations or conditions to invest in this system. So uh, sometimes uh, being so much ambitious means nothing in practical terms. So we must be very careful. But I will go back to this again. Pyrolysis and HTL, I guess, is familiar for you, but anyway, these are processes in the absence of oxygen, pyrolysis. Even if it's not completely true, uh, there are groups like ours or slow pyrolysis of Iowa, Professor Brown, working also on oxidative pyrolysis, but basically, this process is carried out in totally absence of oxygen and uh, heating up the biomass and converting this into liquid, solid, and gases, uh, bio, products, I would say, or bio crudes in the case of the liquids. Hydrothermal processes can be seen in, in kind of pyrolysis in a wet form, if it's HTL, I mean liquefaction, but it can also be carbonization or gasification. Mm, we're not inventing, that's not new, uh, but for example on carbonization there is uh, quite a significant interest in Europe uh, uh, at commercial scale, not yet really deployed, but uh, things are moving quite fast. HTL uh, is highly studied, but uh, definitely we are not at the same, at the same stage. Uh, one point, the feedstock. We have seen it has to be a residue, basically. This is the, the, un, the, the famous list I have shown before. is named Annex I 9, Part A of the Renewable Energy Directive in, in Europe. Well, that list basically push for residues residual streams, agricultural residues, forest residues, uh, and, and several other agro-industrial residues also. So the point is, do we have enough? Well, theoretically, in Europe, we have quite some residues available. Uh, later on, I will convert this in number of plants, but uh, in case of pyrolysis. But, uh, Basically, uh, there are studies also done by NGOs like ICCT or, or other similar institutions claiming some 900 uh, million tons available, of which uh, one third of that could be really made available. So in principle, uh, obviously different type of wastes in the Nordic countries, we have a lot of uh, forest uh, residues in the southern European or Mediterranean area, we have a lot of agricultural residues. Uh, these graphs do not talk about competition for residues. I mean, sometimes uh, that is something you should carefully consider. But let's say that uh, uh, as a matter of potential, we have these residues. Uh, collecting these residues in an economic way is another, is another problem. It's more, more complicated. And also, uh, there's a <laughs> very well-known economic rule that, for instance, uh, you could apply to straw. With straw, mm, with straw can be valued uh, 30 euro per ton, 25, 35, until someone decides to build a plant, and it goes up to 110. These are figures I have seen in reality. So you must be very careful. And it's very dispersed. So collecting this means a lot of logistics and cost. Anything is technically possible, but convincing someone to collect some 100,000 tons of these materials, uh, well, you must give him a very good motivation. Well, uh, some years ago, and uh, Ruben and you were present, I remember, uh, there was a conference in Florence, and a very uh, close friend uh, from VTT made a presentation reviewing the historical uh, development of uh, pyrolysis, starting from Garrett Research, the work of Scott, Piscord, some of these guys, I was lucky, I, I also knew them personally, and then going through some scaling up, some demo, especially the one that I will show you in a moment, the fort and the BTG, and more recent development in this guy list. But, I mean, it's more than 40 years with very, very skilled scientists, good people, very, very well prepared, innovative, and uh, anyway, there's no transport fuel from pyrolysis yet. So, if I compare this with what is happening, uh, what is happening in lignocellulosic ethanol, which in the last 10 years had a huge development, one can argue if it's really commercial or not, but anyway, you have still on the ground at large scale, at commercial scale, in terms of dimension, 
uh, I don't see this in pyrolysis. So uh, later on, I will ask ourselves, but is transport fuel really the way to go for pyrolysis liquid? And I anticipate the answer will not be yes or no, but at least it is a relevant question for ourselves. What, can, what else can we do with this pyrolysis oil? And uh, keep in mind that if you want to go for transport, the fuel must be upgraded to transport uh, conditions. I mean, uh, as Paolo said, transport is a standardized word with infrastructure, engines, everything is standardized for hydrocarbon. You have to comply with that. If you go for different applications like CHP, technology can be adapted to, to the fuel. It's a completely different approach. You couldn't drive with palm oil your car, but you can run a cogeneration plant with your palm oil, for instance. That is something solid up to 60 degrees, for instance. Let's have a look to, yeah, before the break, I think we can go there, the two main industrial initiatives in the EU. Uh, again, uh, TAS 34, TAS 39 report list of this plan, so you can go there on the demo plan data set and, uh, and have a look. But before reporting this plant, let's try to position this on, it's called the Valley of Death, even if it's a, it's a peak actually. And uh, uh, one thing is exactly what, what Paul was addressing, the, the TRL all of fuel readiness level for aviation is where, where, where do we are with uh, these different pathways? And there are some pathways, uh, clearly, I, I guess, for instance, uh, no, sorry. Uh, sorry, want to go back. Okay. I mean, uh, this one, for instance, I'm trying to use this, but <laughs> it's, it, it's nice. That, that should work, yeah. HTL and algae, we are clearly on the early stage or first prototypes, the scale itself. I mean, I'm talking about laboratory scale or few kilograms. We have a plant that's 10 kilograms per hour. It's not so small. When you go to gasification and fissure trop, uh, we have seen a very strong interest in the past years. I mean, last decade. For instance, uh, we had the Coren project in Europe. We have the, the KIT BioLeak, now BioLeak, it was not called Bio at the time, a project for gasification and fissure trope. But actually, uh, the scale, and not only the scale, but the scale uh, was an obstacle, a barrier to development of these technologies. Big plants that probably do not fit very much to the European far farming structure or forest structure. It's not probably only this one, there are other reasons, but that is one critical point. Fast pyrolysis, uh, I would say, is, is in a better situation because we have two demo plants that we're going to see right now that are there. But please, these are not producing transfer fuel. These are producing a bio crude used for heat or ethanol and HVO, hydro treated renewable diesel. These are really full scale, especially HVO. But this has an issue with uh, the feedstock, the lipid-based feedstock. We could talk a lot about it. Lignocellulosic ethanol, uh, actually, again, working with residues at the end of the day is not so easy as with working with good biomass. That is something we have, we have seen. So it's in a good stage of development, probably regarding to the feedstock type, uh, uh, there's still work to do. I always, anyway, report these two graphs here uh, because we will talk about costs later. And we should keep in mind that uh, uh, estimations uh, on costs are very difficult. On the, on the bottom, you see something that it's not me to teach to you. Resilience is the uh, learning curve of uh, ethanol in Brazil. The Goldenberg curve is an elaboration by the Utrecht University. So you see the plant scaling from 120 cubic meter per day to 1,000 cubic meter per day, logistics optimized, and so on and so on. I like to keep this because it's experimental. I mean, it's a fact. On top, you see from uh, academic work the learning curves which is related to the innovation of the technology and the size or the number of units also. 
My point is that very often in your uh, in the presentation you can download. Uh, I will show one from Beto from the from the OE uh, later. You see estimation at the ninth plant, but it's not transparent at all how this ninth plant cost estimation has been carried out. And uh, sometimes I see that they start from interviewing the companies. Uh, and often these companies are already quite optimistic because they want to promote their, uh, understandably, their technology, technological development, their investments. And then we do not really know which kind of uh, estimation applied to calculate the end plant. So um, I wonder if this end plant estimation, cost estimation, really have a sound basis or are guess. And probably something in between, depending on case by case. So let's start with what is on the ground. This is the pyrolysis plant from BTG. Uh, just to recap the story, it took 35 to 40 years to go here. I remember the first work in BTG by uh, the founder uh, of BTG, three Dutch uh, professor, Van Zwei, and uh, Benacker was there, and also Hubstassen. So it took a very long time of a, of a very decisive, very firm uh, decision to pursue this pathway until they got to this first demo plant, uh, which is uh, built in uh, Enschede, near in the north part of Netherlands. It uh, uh, consumes five tons hour at 5% moisture content of biomass and generates roughly three tons of pyrolysis oil and, um, and some electricity. Uh, first, which kind of biomass do they use? Very clever type of biomass because, you know, pyrolysis is very sensitive to the ash content, the ash composition. It's complicated. So they went in Rotterdam, made a very nice contact with the residues for a pellet transported from Canada to Europe. You know, when you transport pellet, you have some pellet breaking during the transport, which is quite a relevant amount in a, in a Rotterdam port, so be. So they collect this material, which is low ash, already comminuted, already well dried, and they dry further before it comes. So that keep in mind. So it's not like having forest residues and running the rotating cone. You don't get this kind of oil. Uh, anyway, these are data you can see in the present. The important thing is here, I mean, the, because uh, since it was a long development plan, so from lab, from a small pilot, from the demo unit, which is 250, 200 uh, kilogram per hour, to this, uh, that is some tons per hour, so there was a logic in this development. Now they are almost at uh, running a design capacity, which means producing three and something tons of pyrolysis oil per hour. And that is an achievement indeed. Um, I will come back to the scale of these plants later on when we will discuss about the uh, techno-economic assessment. This is the other plant, completely different approach. Uh, we are uh, still uh, north of Netherlands. And we have uh, an integration of the uh, pyrolysis plant uh, into a large-scale uh, uh, furnace flood ice bed boiler. And uh, you see uh, the bio-oil is uh, exiting after the condenser uh, and transported for, for heat uh, generation. Uh, Biomass is, is, is crushed here, and then it goes into the process. Uh, you have the pyrolyzer here. And, uh, and the sand is circulating with the water. So it's, it's integrated. And the condensable gas, which are up here, are fed to the boiler. So it's very, very integrated uh, configuration with a feedstock capacity of 50 megawatt. Keep in mind this number, 50 megawatt, integrated already in a large scale plant, large for, to me, for instance, for Italian conditions, quite large, probably not. So summarizing, we have uh, approximately 50,000 tons of uh, pyrolysis uh, by oil per year in one case and 24 in the other one. Uh, 30 megawatt plant, 50 megawatt plant, approximately one is the double the other. Uh, of uh, in one case forest waste and the other case clean wood actually. Uh, application is industrial boiler, heavy fuel oil replacement. So 
In that case, we are not yet talking about transport fuel. There's a lot of work done also by BTG. They're very good in hydro treating this stuff, but we cannot say that there is a demo plant for transport fuel from pyrolysis. There are other uh, technology developers like uh, RTP and uh, Ensign with a number of interesting projects. Again, uh, uh, in, uh, in Georgia and Malaysia, uh, there's one uh, uh, planned also here in Brazil, in Canada. But, I mean, I remark again this point, heating oil clients. Also, in that case, we are still... Uh, the only link between these plants and transport will be, and we will see in a moment, is integration with FCC reactors, fluidized catalyt uh, fluid catalytic uh, cracker reactor in refineries for gasoline production. Uh, we will see. Uh, we have an ongoing project, uh, which uh, the counterpart is uh, CTBA, uh, Dr. Bonomi. Uh, in Italy, the coordinator is the University of Bologna, in which we have a bilateral cooperation between European uh, group and uh, Brazilian team. And we, uh, as record, and together with Biochemtas, VTT, CN, and BTG, we will address the integration of pyrolysis oil in, in various forms, fast, intermediate, uh, uh, also biochar will, will get into discussion here, uh, into, uh, for example, lignocellulosic as an plant or, or to optimize the logistics. The project has just started a few months ago, I mean two or three months ago, in Europe and not yet in <laughs> Brazil. Okay, uh, so we can have the coffee break here and then I will start from that slide uh, when I come back. Okay. <clears throat> we continue with uh, uh, some consideration about technoeconomical aspect. But first of all, we have to uh, have a look to our products of fast pyrolysis oil. Even the good ones, huh? Let's... I change color to red because... <laughs> So this is fast pyrolysis by oil. Uh, you can find a lot of names, bio crude oil, BCO, bio oil, BO, FPO, fast pyrolysis oil. Now, more recently, it seems that everybody's using this acronym, fast pyrolysis by oil, which means pyrolysis oil through fast pyrolysis process done from biomass. Anyway, be ready. The point is that it has nothing to do with oil. And for us, maybe it's not an issue, but very often we had to face uh, this to explain that we are talking about something that is not an oil, but is a mixture of uh, organics uh, with a very, very high uh, oxygen content. You can see here it's between 40 and 50 percent oxygen. It is very, very acidic, it's polar. Uh, you see it's more dense than water. It gets easily 30 to even even 35 percent sometimes of water. Um, pH is almost uh, two two and a half up to three, which means it's really really acid, a special material. And um, uh, what else? It's difficult to store in many cases. And uh, depending on the process, you can find solids that can be char particles or sand particles. And again, these have consequences on the mechanical behavior of pumps, for instance, the sand, or the stability of the oil, because char is acting as a, a catalyst in degradation processes. So it's really, I would say, a, a, a nasty stuff, difficult to, to handle. But as it is, it can be used for some application, not for transport. And if you compare to all the other transport fuel, and even this that is not a transport fuel, is a straight vegetable oil or tal oil, uh, anyway, we are very, very far from this. And uh, the, uh, clearly the road to upgrade this to transport is really, is really long in our case. But it's from lignocellulosic. Uh, just one remark, because I know the company is working on that, uh, very sensitive to that. Tal oil is an oil, but it's from lignocellulose, it's from, from the pulping process, basically. So the, 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 the origin of the material is still lignocellulose. And uh, there's a debate on this moment on the directive about this, including or not in the famous Annex, uh, Annex 9. So actually, sometimes I think it's useful to remember that we are not really inventing 
things. Sometimes or very often or in majority of the case, someone before us already uh, proposed similar schemes. For example, this is the centralized pyrolysis and then centralized gasification schemes that was already developed in the first half of 2000s by uh, F. Zeta K. Today is Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. At that time it was Fortune Center in Karlsruhe of Technology by Edmund Henrik that is retired some years ago. Basically, the idea was, let's have a series of pyrolysis plant decentralized on the land, mixing pyrolysis and char, so the efficiency becomes quite high because both char and oil are valuable products, and transport these to one centralized station to gasify and to go for fissure drop to transport fuels. Uh, the system they were using uh, was developed by uh, Lurdi, Lurgi in the 50s, was a twin screw co-rotating reactors with sand in that uh, to have a fast pyrolysis process between the screw. And uh, then the oil was condensed, and the char was mixed with the oil, and everything was supposed to be transported. Every square here, I mean, uh, one of these is one, sorry, uh, is uh, one plant, so, this in red is one pyrolysis plant. The yellow circle is one gasification plant, assuming Germany as a reference. And they did quite a, a lot of work. They used the straw at that time. Uh, the dimension of the overall system was uh, um, quite large indeed. Uh, but uh, the point is that uh, um, the slurry uh, of oil and char had a density of approximately 16 uh, gigajoule per square meter, per cubic meter, while the straw itself is two. So the, there is a huge impact on logistics and economies of the logistics by using pyrolysis as a pretreatment step. So it, in that sense, it, it makes sense. Uh, gasification was centralized and uh, uh, typical or refinery scale, I mean, uh, one million ton oil equivalent per year, which uh, is quite big for Europe, probably not for here. You can find a lot of interesting works done uh, uh, still in the year 2000 by the group of the University of Vienna, Professor of Bauer, studying how can we downscale the fissure trap process. And the conclusion was, at that time, it's not possible to downscale too much to be competitive with price. But, you know, Austria has no arbor, has no... So it needs to study this as it can be downscaled. Anyway, uh, just to say that a lot uh, has been done. Nevertheless, uh, given the, the difficulty with... Um, uh, with uh, with uh, fissure drop, industrial scale fissure drop. Actually, this process uh, in KIT evolved in a different direction. Now it goes to uh, methanol and DME, DME synthesis, dimethylether, or, or even uh, or even gasoline in that moment. So uh, actually, fissure drop is not so successful anymore in that uh, in that moment. Uh, in our uh, region. An interesting work that was done by VTT was about, uh, uh, again, comparing thermal and catalytic pyrolysis in centralized and decentralized scheme. But to me, the nice thing was the color of the square. Uh, cyan is industrial, green is pilot, uh, yellow is large and untested, uh, gray is lab scale. <clears throat> and that is nice because not many works enter in such details, discussing what is really, uh, what we can really consider ready to go for upscaling. And upgrade, uh, this was from uh, 2015, so it's not so long time ago, still consider upgraded almost lab scale, maybe small pilot. And the hydrogen also is largely untested. And there's still catalytic pyrolysis regeneration systems is still uh, uh, at pilot, we do have a project in this moment with the university with Bioenergy 2020 on that. So, uh, actually, we are not uh, discussing something that is full scale industrialized. And they were comparing a scheme similar to the one I have shown before with a four times distributed fast pyrolysis unit and a centralized upgrading with a centralized hydrogen plant, or otherwise a completely 
centralized catalytic systems. The conclusion was that uh, it can be done, it can go below 110 euro per, per megawatt hour, uh, depending on the, on the system. Uh, uh, the configuration can be slightly different. I mean, decentralized or one large plant, uh, uh, decentralized configuration seems uh, preferable at a certain scale, uh, and uh, thermal pyrolysis seems as well preferable. But the point to me I wish to remark is that the plant I have shown is 50 to 20 megawatt thermal, the industrial ones, Fortum and BTG. Here we are talking about 250 to 400 megawatt plant. So it's one order of magnitude bigger than the larger demo we have. Uh, maybe somewhere this can be done. Not easy to imagine this scale uh, in Europe. Cost estimations. Uh, this, I, I anticipated before, this is from uh, BETO, uh, Bioenergy Technology Office of DOE, uh, April this year, so it's very recent. And this is how they plan to uh, go down with price for, for <clears throat> pyrolysis. And, and also you have the different components, uh, how they impact on cost reduction. Um, this, uh, these figures are quite consistent with others, one in particular I show now. Uh, but definitely we are uh, still, uh, this is the minimum fuel selling price is called. Uh, we are at $4.67 uh, uh, in uh, the projection for this year. So, <clears throat> so if we put this, I mean, uh, what we have seen was that one, basically. And this is the co-processing, we will go on that in a moment. This, these two are the pyrolysis. The other, you see, is fuels for aviation, sugar and HVO based. HVO, cellulosic ethanol, biomethane, DME and fisiotropes. These are the estimation of uh, <clears throat> basically the European industry. And, uh, and you see that standalone still stay uh, in comparable figure of what we have seen before. And uh, the only way to go down to something comparable with HVO, with pyrolysis, is co-processing. But there's one big but on that uh, we will see soon. Let's have a look. This is uh, co-processing. The idea is that I can blend, basically, with uh, uh, vacuum gas oil, my fast pyrolysis by oil, in a share that is something between 5 and 10 percent. You can find also 20 or higher. But typically, the, the, the share that the industries like PTG or the others are considered is goes down to 5%, maximum 10%, and get uh, uh, in FCC uh, your hydrocarbons, which looks nice because, I mean, at the end of the day, I, sa I save a lot of uh, effort in upgrading and I go straight in an existing installation in a refinery, not, not to build a new, a new plant. And several years ago, among others, uh, Petrobras tested uh, some cubic meters of uh, uh, BTG oil with, uh, with good results, uh, uh, upgraded or partly upgraded or crude. Uh, more recently, if, yes, uh, this is the work that uh, I don't know if Helena will report on that during this conference. Helena Chum and uh, uh, Ruben Massofilio. But anyway, the point is that the similar work done on enzyme oil, if I'm not wrong. And uh, the nice thing is that results are comparable. 30% uh, of renewable carbon stays in the gasoline for something between 5 and 20%, but more, I would say, 5 to 10% co processing of uh, fast pyrolysis oil. Some, someone see this uh, in a negative way. Uh, some others, like Petrobras and BTG, is, consider this already quite a good result. I'm more uh, in, that, in that way. I think it's, it's a good result in absolute terms. Uh, at least from the logistic uh, and industrial integration, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, the distance to fossil fuel, uh, to the cost of fossil fuel is reduced. Also, UOP Honeywell made similar work uh, with the lower uh, share of uh, pyrolysis oils or RTP green fuel addition. 
I, I stopped here because uh, I, I was looking even the last weeks to, to some information on that uh, development, but I was unable to find and even in Chicago two weeks ago, TC Biomass Conference, uh, I didn't find new uh, status of this. But at least they're going all in the same direction. But what is the problem for us in Europe? The problem is this one. This is the demand uh, for fuels and transport in Europe. What uh, Paolo said, we are not living alone. We have to live in an existing environment. The existing environment is that, to be very frank, our ethanol is really the last things the oil companies would like to see on the market because their problem is that we don't have diesel and we have an overproduction of gasoline that must be placed on market uh, which are difficult to compete for us like Asian market. So uh, we lost roughly 20% by uh, not by refining capacity in Europe. 20% refining capacity closing down. That's why we have this interest in retrofitting the refinery from Total, ENI of Gela, of La Med in France, of uh, Porto Marghera, because these are refineries that should shut down. It means that from some thousand people it's occupied there, you go down to 30 to, to keep the storage tanks. So. Uh, the integration of bio in the refinery is motivated not just by the bio issue, but by the refining problem. That is connected to this. So, summarizing, in this moment we need something to substitute diesel and kerosene more than gasoline. And that's why integration with FCC at this moment is not seen very interesting. Even if there are works, I've seen some uh, uh, titled surrounding conferences and in uh, papers, trying, even from Canada, trying to modify the FCC process and the catalyst to go for longer chain hydrocarbons. But I don't have much information on that. Is this situation changing in Europe? We expect, we expect that this will change, but you understand, to change this you must to change first the car industry. So. We all consider this to happen, but probably we will need 10, 20 years to see uh, some changes here. And, uh, and, and then another point, we have a huge import. You see, uh, we, for instance, completely import the kerosene, which is roughly 50,000 tons per, uh, 50 million tons, sorry, per year of kerosene, which is imported. Uh, again, another big difference between Europe and the rest of the world is that we currently, in our directive, only concentrate on CO2 emission, greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, for instance, the, 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 the act that in the United States supports renewable energy is named Energy Independent and Security Act. There is no word about greenhouse gas, there is no word about sustainability, even if it then delivers money to solar, to renewables, and so on. But the title, to me, it tells a lot of the mentality of the Americans compared to the Europeans. We have the Renewable Energy Directive. They have the Energy Independent and Security Act. We found this word in the introduction of the directive, but then in the uh, in the in the binding conditions, you don't you don't find this. You only find CO2 reduction. So that is something. So my point is, what else could we do with this pyrolysis oil? And to me. That's one clear answer, that is cogeneration. Uh, this is the situation cogeneration in Europe. And, uh, and you see that uh, cogeneration from uh, renewable sources is expanding uh, very much, the green, uh, the other are contracting, and that bio, biofuel, biomass and biogas is the dominating component of CHP. Obviously, there's nothing uh, unexpected here, but it's a growing uh, path. Actually, there was a lot of work done even by our small group in the 90s on that, from Varsila, from VTT, from Onro Diesel, from BTG, from the University of Florence, from the University of Zaragoza. A lot of people trying to run engines and gas turbines with pyrolysis oil, crude pyrolysis oil, not upgraded. Uh, we still continue, you see here, to work on gas turbines. This is a modified combustion chamber of our gas turbines. These were previous work on engines. This here 
is the Varsila engine modified in the mid of the 90s to run with diesel and pyrolysis oil with a pilot flame of diesel. E Ormrod in UK had something similar. So actually this was done and uh, nobody's talking anymore and it's quite surprising to me about bioelectricity. But we are talking about pyrefinery. Pyrefinery has also electricity in that or products that can go into electricity. Lignin, for instance, in lignocellulosic ethanol configuration, it generates electricity. So if the advantage of using uh, a liquid like biocrude oil for cogeneration is that I can quite easily develop cogeneration systems that meet the demand. I mean, if I have a huge bioenergy plant, the typical problem for us, we are not in Finland, it's a warm country like here, I don't find tens of megawatts of hot water to be placed on the market. I mean, in Tuscany we have four months of heating, five probably, full stop. In Finland it's ten sometimes. So, hot water for us is not a solution. Industrial steam is, or other, other, uh, other application, like for instance, uh, absorption cycles to generate cold for cooling. So if I downscale the cogeneration plant, I can find a lot of applications. Supermarket, for instance, is the first thing. They consume electricity, heating and cooling. And the scale is 100 of kilowatts to few megawatts. That is the range. Uh, that is an example of a new gas turbine. We are going to apply for a proposal in, the, in this January. This is 400 kilowatt, which can be very well integrated with the heat generation systems, which can be uh, controlled to increase or reduce the ratio of power to heat. And, uh, and it's very cost effective. And uh, on, on that part here, you see the projection for pyrolysis oil in the long term. Uh, they estimate at the ninth plant, and again, I do not know what they do with the ninth plant, but to go with a biomass price of 40 euro per ton dry to 60, to go down to 200, 250. So if I apply my cost for the plant that I have shown to this fuel cost, I come out, uh, I, I, I will tell you, it's probably a, an optimistic estimation because many details I do not have, so I'm sure there are some cost items which I cannot calculate now. But the order of magnitude is two to six year payback period, with or without incentives. That is something you can work on. I mean, uh, if the technology develops and the, and the bio crude oil price goes in that direction, maybe you can find. And that is extremely, in, uh, in terms of plants, it means some thousand plants with the residue. So that, that is not the point. Uh, the interesting thing is this one. Uh, we carried out the studies last year on biomass for balancing the grid. The point is that this is the situation in Europe. Every country, you see uh, the, the, the dark blue is hydro and the green is bio. All the rest is variable renewable energy, means solar and wind. Germany and part, in part Netherlands are already facing problem in some periods of the year to introduce variable energy, variable electricity, variable power into the grid. So we have an issue in balancing. So now if you apply the idea of using a bioliquid, which is not a biofuels, is a bioliquid uh, in European regulation means a liquid that is used for power and heat. So if you use this to generate power and heat and to control the grid in the long term, this can make a lot of difference and you can downscale at the centralized level. The, the famous smart grid concept needs someone to balance this grid. And, and liquid can be one of the possible solutions. No, I'm not saying is the solution, but uh, it's curious that bioelectricity in our debate in Europe is disappeared from the discussion. We talk about biofuels, solar, and wind, uh, but then electricity is, is needed to balance the system, or surplus electricity has to be used for power to X, and so on. And there are, for instance, in that area of day ahead market or intraday market, there is the possibility to control a pyrolysis oil cogeneration plant to regulate the power to the level to deliver balancing, which means high price and most likely in the future special 
type of support. What we would expect is that Balancey will receive some premium in the long term. Not today yet, but it, it should come. Going through uh, and then closing to the end. Pyrolysis can be used to many other things. For instance, we have used with used cooking oil. And uh, now there are pretreatments for hydro treat hydro processing vegetable oils. When we start this project on biokerosene, for instance, Neste was not using it was not possible for them to use use cooking oil. And pyrolysis can be well used. Uh, this is our uh, unit. Uh, um, yeah, this is the, the pyrolyzer, and, uh, and here you don't see in the back there is a catalytic reactor, which is this one with the, with the catalyst, and uh, we, we produce almost 70% uh, hydrocarbon yield here. Pyrolysis is quite insensitive to contam contamination in a way. It's a root process compared to, uh, to, to HVO, for instance. Uh, we we have done also work on, on algae. Here you see some demo plants uh, uh, that we built. This is the largest in Europe, one hectare. This is in Chile, in uh, Antofagasta. is a coal power station, and we designed, we made the engineering of the entire plant. Entire plants mean it's not uh, it's not pond. An algae plant is inoculum, photobioreactor, pumping. Uh, first type of ponds, the small ones. Uh, second type of pond with starvation, centrifuge, separation. It's it's a plant. It's a lot of components. This is w what I mean with with engineering. And, uh, th and then we pyrolyze these things. Uh, probably it's very far to go uh, to make a, a fuel out of. Algae because one kilo of algae costs uh, 20 euro per ton and the fuel costs 0.5. So, but however, just technically speaking, the interesting thing is that if you go with this process, uh, uh, there's no need to uh, stress uh, the production of lipids in the algae. Again, this type of process must be seen as, as a wall. The plant you put at the end. Uh, also determines how you cultivate the microorganisms. If I want to make biodiesel, for instance, out of algae, I have to cultivate the algae to produce a lot of lipids and to esterify the lipids into biodiesel. If I pyrolyze, there's no need to apply nitrogen starvation. So it means that uh, uh, this group of ponds uh, will not do nitrogen starvation, but will simply be growth ponds. So we'll produce more, but less lipids. Well, if you go for, let's have a look to uh, to this LHV, the calorific value. This is algae that are uh, starved, and this is algae that is non-starved. And you see that more or less the, the calorific value of the pyrolysis oil is similar. What, uh, what changes a bit is the nit nitrogen content. That uh, obviously, if I have more proteins, carbohydrates, and other products than lipids, I will find more also in the oil. So just to say that what you put downstream and what you do upstream, these two things are not independent. Uh, aviation biofuels, uh, I mean, here you have some data I don't, don't need to go through, but it is a major contributor to, uh, to CO2 emission, is a priority in Europe, but is a very, very challenging fuel. This, it is possible to produce aviation from pyrolysis of lignin cellulose. There are a lot of papers and reports already published by, especially by my friends in BTG and in Netherlands, but also from Sasol in South Africa. Uh, but it's a very complicated matter. To make an example, we need a certain amount of aromatics, between 8 and 25%. This range must be expected, no less than 8, no more than 25, because the sealing must as well to guarantee good sealing, and if you have too much, you have pollution. In, in the case of kerosene, uh, or jet fuels, not kerosene, even the type of aromatics is important, because they can generate very small deposits in the engines. In, a, in, a, in an airplane, the fuel is also used as a coolant. So basically, the specification goes from minus 41 to plus 300. And you must have no deposits on that. So the type of aromatics, so it's really, really uh, challenging. And this fuel is the less supported than any other, because 
Fossil costs 600 euro per ton uh, on the market, fossil kerosene, and the production goes from 1,500 to 2,500. So it's really far more than a road transport fuel. There are many routes to go there. There's no time to go into, into that details. Uh, I just want to remark one point. You can drive a car with biodiesel, which is something that it looks like a gas, a diesel oil, but it's very different. It's an oxygenated fuel. You would never fly with a fuel that is not pure biojet, no? What does it mean in practical terms for the industry? It means that to certify, according to an ASCM, a fuel to be used, a biojet to be used on a plane, you roughly need three years and eight million euro investments. I mean, from the moment you already have the fuel to certify these things, because it's a complicated process, four-step process. And here you see what is already approved. And these are other routes that are under certification. But as I said, it's extremely expensive to do this. And by the way, once you certify one route, for instance, I don't know, let, let's take uh, co-processing for him. If I certify this route, I do not certify for my company this route. I certify for any company producing this fuel in the market. So one point that has been discussed many times is maybe a public institution should support certification specifically because it's not just for a company. It's for the sector that uh, otherwise a single company say, why should I do this? And I conclude now with policy. Uh, as I said, uh, we have a demand for mostly concentrated on cars, uh, heavy and light trucks, and marine and aviation. But for us, cars means diesel, mostly, <clears throat> in Europe. And uh, in fact, now the recent call, uh, from also from the European Commission, focuses on maritime heavy duty and kerosene as priority. And. Um, it, we expect uh, to expand uh, uh, here aviation uh, to 70% and to have a kind of uh, uh, reduction, what you were saying, to 2050 of gasoline. So we plan that uh, uh, um, not sorry, that is uh, uh, you don't see gasoline and diesel here. You see only cars. <laughs> it's in another chart. Uh, anyway, you see, cars are reducing a bit because of modal transport, electrification, uh, and other type of transportation, and to have a shift to aviation and freight. Uh, I will conclude with the directive. Uh, the directive is under discussion. As I said, the, the big point is that there is no technology in the definition, and I, we don't expect anything will change with this respect. Ah, sorry. Uh, Look here, part B, and this is part A. Just to clarify, part A are the residues, and these are the advanced fuels. This part B, so far, is basically used cooking oil and animal fats of category one and two. Uh, these are not advanced fuels, but are double counted. This will disappear, pretty sure, in the new directive. So there will not be double counting anymore for lipids, but it will be, it will have to be residual. And um, there will be probably multiple counting only for aviation and for maritime application. Uh, this is the forum where we coordinate with more than 100 participants. These are the uh, task coordinator. You can see people from BTG, from Biocampus, Nest, uh, Biomethanex, uh, uh, Lanzatec, Sky Energy, Stena, Volvo, Fiat, uh, uh, Sherbrooke Universities, TCB from India, and so on. Uh, but few people under realize that we are talking about this window with our directive, which is almost, uh, I don't want to use too strong words, but let's say it's very, very modest, very low ambitious, because our target in terms of uh, the famous two degrees reduction would require this amount. And our directive now is here. Almost no change with current situation. And uh, <clears throat> there's no time to enter into this point, but it's really 
depressive. Uh, one thing we are proposing is to use a definition instead of a list, which makes a lot of difference because when you have a feedstock that is not listed but is sustainable, you simply cannot use because it's not in the list. Tobacco is a good example. We have uh, 30,000 hectares of tobacco cultivation in my country. This land is not used for food. So if you switch from smoke to fuel, there's no la land change. So in principle, it should be an advanced fuel, but it's not because it's not in the list. That's an example. Another thing the industry is asking is to have a differentiation between the target. Not put all together. Otherwise, for instance, the lipids probably will, will, will eat all the other targets of lignocellulosic and the electricals and so on. And uh, concluding, uh, the biggest message is to us for a long-term term uh, policy framework. Because uh, to build one of these plants takes four years, uh, sometimes even five, and the directive lasts ten. The last two years are not usable for a number of reasons. So basically, the time frame is too short. And, uh, and to have penalties for non-compliance. This is the other strong... Uh, strong message. There are, you can find on the site, so there's no need now to go through this, but on the site you find the detailed messages from the industry about the policy. And um, this is the pyrolysis, uh, this is the aviation, the aviation probably is the most complicated, and this is basically my, my last slide. Aviation is the most complicated because it's global. And uh, uh, we in Europe are applying European rules, and we don't realize that uh, whatever we decide, there is I ICAO and ASTM and these guys that, that are more important than our regional interests. So we could have the absurd situation of a plane leaving the US with the biofuels, which is sustainable, and landing in Amsterdam or Paris with a fuel that is not sustainable and cannot be blended, cannot be counted. It's impossible even to, to manage these things. So harmonizing sustainability criteria here is crucial, but I don't see much uh, possibility in this moment that this will happen soon. Uh, so the final word is that this market, if we look at the industry, if we look at research, is different. But if we ask industry to invest, we must give them a policy. Uh, otherwise, whatever we do as researcher, it will not be implemented by industry. And the industry needs a certain stable policy framework for a long time with very clear rules. Then they can adapt to it in some way. But if they change every five years, like it is happening in Europe, they will not invest. So there will be no plant and probably also research will be diminished. And uh, next year, probably we will have read done this, this period. I expect uh, June this next year will be uh, finished, uh, uh, the procedure in the worst case, and we will know which will be the rule for the next uh, decade. That's all. Thank you very much. These people provided me some, some data. Thank you very much.